grace, and peace, and welcome in the name of our risen Lord Jesus the Christ. The Lord be with you. We'll wait. We're delighted to see you here, those of you who are in person, and delighted to have those of you who are at home worshiping with us. And we trust that via the the power of the Spirit, that though we may be separated by distance, we are joined together as one, as the living body of Christ. As the living body of Christ, we gather, come before God and worship. God is always there, always present, but we're not always present to God. And so we set aside spaces and times for worship to attune us to that presence of God that is always there. And so trusting that by the Spirit, the presence of the risen Christ moves among us, let us together offer our worship to God. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Let us come to God with our burdens. Let us offer our prayers to God. Let us say together the prayer of confession that is in, printed in your order of worship. Loving God, our world is so broken, so filled with hate and violence and pain. People commit appalling horrors in your name, horrors that has left us scarred. We confess that these horrors tempt us to hate rather than love, and we struggle to trust that the way of Jesus is the right way. Merciful God, ignore our doubts and increase our faith. Help us to get behind Jesus and follow where he leads. Fill us with your spirit that we may show the world your life-giving love.
The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And God's love is poured out like an ever-flowing stream. And in the waters of baptism, we are joined to that love. In the waters, we are made new. All that separates us from God is washed away. All that separates us one from another is washed away. And we are called beloved children of God. Friends, believe the good news we see enacted in the waters of baptism. In Christ, God comes in love. And we are forgiven made new, called beloved children. Thanks be to God. And now may the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, be with you all. and you totally forget what you're supposed to do. Let's, let's do this in the right place. The peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with you all. Our first scripture reading this morning is from the book of Proverbs, chapter 1, verses 20 through 33. Wisdom cries out in the street. In the squares, she raises her voice. At the busiest corner, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing, and fools hate knowledge? Give heed to my reproof. I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make my words known to you, because I have called you and you refused, have stretched out my hand and no one heeded. And because you have ignored all my counsel, I would have none of my rep- and would have none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock you, will mock when panic strikes you, when panic strikes you like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, would have none of my counsel and despised all my reproof. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their way and be sated with their own devices. For waywardness kills the simple, and the complacency of fools destroys them. But those who listen to me will be secure and will live at ease without dread of disaster. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our gospel reading for this morning comes from the eighth chapter of Mark's gospel. We're moving fairly deep into the story now. And Jesus begins to try to teach the disciples what sort of Messiah he is, not that they're all that receptive. Listen for what the Spirit may speak to us through these words. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The beginning of this school year has been met by staunch resistance to masks on some people's part. There was a parent in Texas that actually went up and ripped the mask off of a teacher. And for reasons that continue to baffle me, this resistance to both vaccines and masks is, is often couched in religious terms. Last year, as a rebuttal to such thinking, Scott Hosey, a, a pastor who's on the faculty at Calvin Theological Seminary, uh, penned a, a blog post entitled JWWM, Jesus Would Wear a Mask. And he opened the, the blog post with a, an updated take on Jesus' temptation by the devil. He writes, Then the devil led Jesus to the entrance of the Jerusalem farmer's market. Jesus observed that most people were prudently wearing face coverings and masks to protect from a severe virus that had made many in the holy city sick in recent weeks. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, then enter the market, talk, shop, and laugh, but do not wear a mask, for it is written, he will give his angels charge over you. And so we know God will protect you and others from the virus. And Jesus replied, it is also written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus then put on his face coverings and entered the market in search of some fresh figs. The devil then left him until a more opportune time. Until a more opportune time is a reference to when Jesus struggles in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he is once again tempted to turn away from the path God has placed before him. But, but there is a, a hint of that temptation to, to come 
in our gospel reading for this morning. Much of Mark's gospel is occupied with questions of Jesus' identity. The reader is told that Jesus is the Son of God at the very opening of the gospel, but no human in the gospel ever identifies Jesus as such until after Jesus dies on the cross. When Jesus stills a storm while his disciples and him are in a boat in the sea, they, the disciples ask one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, it's been a a good while since that happened when Jesus, in our reading today, asked the disciples who people say that he is and, more importantly, who they say that he is. Who is Jesus? How would you answer that question? On some level, there is a fair amount of agreement among Christians, conservative, liberal, in between, on the identity of Jesus. Anyone who joins a Presbyterian church, any Presbyterian church, says that Jesus is their Lord and Savior, and the most fundamentalist evangelical would be more than happy to say exactly the same thing. Christians can agree on labels for Jesus. Christ, Messiah, Lord, Son of God, and more are used as easily by liberals as they are by conservatives. Yet a casual observer would be forgiven for concluding that there must be multiple Jesuses out there. There's so much incompatible behavior on the part of those who say they follow him. One Jesus is a pacifist. Another Jesus believes in a strong military, personal freedom, and the right to bear arms. Another Jesus is simply a wise sage. Yet another Jesus is an advocate for the poor and oppressed. Some who claim and profess Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior also profess undying loyalty to Donald Trump and felt compelled to attack the Capitol on January 6. Other devout followers of Jesus are absolutely certain that such Christians have irreparably damaged the Jesus brand. This problem of competing images of Jesus is already there in the Bible. The stories of Jesus' temptation by the devil are about the struggle over what kind of Messiah Jesus will be. And in our gospel reading this morning, even one of Jesus' most ardent supporters has an image of Jesus, an image for the Messiah that causes him to rebuke Jesus, to try and straighten him out. Peter, perhaps speaking on behalf of all the other disciples, correctly identifies Jesus as Messiah, as the Christ, as God's anointed. But for Peter, Messiah, his image for Messiah, is incompatible with suffering and dying. A Messiah should be a conquering hero, not a a victim, a loser. Surely Jesus can see that. What sort of Lord, Savior, Son of God do you see when you think about Jesus? More importantly, where does your image come from? Jesus says that the problem with Peter's image of Messiah arises from the fact that he got it 
from a mind set not on divine things, but on human things. And he offers a corrective for this problem. It involves getting behind Jesus, self-denial, and a cross. I frequently borrowed a well-worn quote from that wonderfully irreverent Christian writer, Anne Lamott, who says, you can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out God hates all the same people you do. That's a perfect definition of a mind set on human things rather than divine. And it is a perennial problem for religion. All too often, religion, both the conservative and the liberal sorts, wants to enlist God, to enlist Jesus in what we want and what we desire. But Jesus insists that salvation, life that is good and whole and what it is meant to be, requires exactly the reverse. It requires letting Jesus lead, letting what God wants and God desires reshape us and give us new identities. Recently, I've been reading a book that explores how it was that an obscure Jewish messianic movement focused on Jesus somehow swept like wildfire over the Mediterranean world in a matter of a few centuries. The book argues that one among several reasons has to do with the strange behavior of Christians during a pair of horrible epidemics that struck the empire. The first began in the year 165, and lasted for 15 years and may well have wiped out a third of the population of the Roman Empire. A second epidemic nearly as bad struck 70 years later. Now the Romans didn't understand anything about germs or fighting a viral epidemic, but they did correctly intuit that contact with sick people was likely to spread the illness. And so when these plagues struck, people with means fled to the countryside. People avoided contact with other people as much as possible. And those who were sick were very often simply left alone to die. But the Christians did not flee the cities nor did they leave people alone to die. They ministered to the sick, both fellow Christians and non-Christian neighbors. Many Christians got sick and died as a result. But many were saved by this risky behavior. People who would never have recovered had there not been someone there who brought them food and water and who nursed them back to health. In the end, Christians survived these plagues in much greater numbers because of their risky care for one another. And their non-Christian neighbors were grateful and were impressed by these people who would risk their lives caring for others. Perhaps these Christians had, had grasped what Peter could not, at least not until Good Friday and Easter. The God who comes to us in Jesus moves towards the suffering of the world, suffers with the world. And this Jesus says to those who are drawn to him, get behind me, follow me, follow me towards the suffering of the world. And be prepared to suffer with it and for it. Now, understandably, 
Suffering and pain frighten us. No doubt that's why Peter did not want a Messiah who said he would suffer and would die. And why would we follow Jesus into a path that can lead to pain and suffering? Why would we open ourselves to such pain? Why would we become so vulnerable? Richard Rohr writes this about vulnerability. Only vulnerability forces us beyond ourselves. Whenever we see true pain, most of us are drawn out of our own preoccupations and want to take away the pain. For example, when we rush towards a hurting child, we also rush towards the suffering God. We want to take the suffering in our arms. That's why so many saints wanted to get near suffering, because as they said again and again, they meet Christ there. It saved them from their smaller, untrue self. I do not fully understand the mystery of a God who suffers. A God who in Jesus is not at all what Peter expects or what we expect or maybe even want. And yet there is something comforting in knowing that God is not removed and distant and aloof from the suffering that is all so common in our world and in our lives. And if this suffering Jesus is to be believed, then getting behind him, giving our lives over to him, losing our lives for him, if you will, will save our lives, will lead us into true life in all its fullness. Dare we believe this? Dare we be Christian? Dare we actually follow this Jesus. All praise and glory to the God who comes to us in Jesus to show us the shape of true, genuine human life. Thanks be to God. Now I invite you to stand and join with me as we profess our faith, the faith into which we were baptized, using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ,
God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Is God real? Was not the question I was expecting when Sawyer raised his hand across my Zoom screen last spring. Believe it or not, in 10 years of teaching godly play, no one had ever asked me that question. Caught a little off guard, I paused, fumbling for how to respond, when from somewhere off camera, his mother said, what do you think? I think he's real, said Sawyer, but I haven't seen him. There are lots of things in the world that we may not see or may not ever see, but that doesn't mean they aren't real, I said. God is one of those things. That's why we come here to Godly Play. We sing, we listen to stories, we wonder, we respond, and we pray so that we can know God, even though we don't see him. This simple interaction illustrates what I love about godly play. Godly play is a place where we come to see and hear and feel God so that we can say, I know that God is real. In our godly play story called The Ten Best Ways, the story of Moses and the Ten Commandments, we say that God came so close to Moses and Moses came so close to God that Moses knew what he had to do. In fact, many of the godly play stories include the idea of God coming close to someone and them coming close to him in return. Godly play provides a space for children and grown-ups to come close to each other and close to God. It is one of the places I feel closest to God. That closeness is one of the reasons I continue to teach godly play. I invite you to come experience this closeness, to see and hear and feel God and know that God is real. Pray with me. Lord God, this morning I want to remind myself that when I am falling and the world around me keeps on falling and falling, I need to stop. And remember that when fear and loss seem so real, your spirit never leaves me. Pain and loss have always been my threshold to the spirit. Without pain and loss, I'm just busy doing my life. With pain and loss, I break open. I'm forced into awareness of your holy presence. I wish it were not so. The Spirit is present even when we don't see it or feel it or even believe it. In the 14th chapter of John, Jesus spoke to his followers for the last time and he said, I will ask God and he will give you another comforter, an advocate who will abide with you forever. It is the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept the spirit because it can neither see him or know him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Mother and Father God, this morning we hold up our losses so that we can see them clearly and acknowledge to others and to ourselves that our suffering is real. Are some people suffering more 
Maybe so, and yet this suffering is yours. The poet and essayist Brian Doyle says it this way. He calls it the hell of a parade of things going wrong and the heaven of none. We feel the heavy brick of dread, remembering the towers coming down, the ripped open hole in the Pentagon, the scorched earth in a field in Pennsylvania. Most Holy One, we ask for your anointing, like oil on our foreheads, profound knowing that your Holy Spirit is present with us, bringing comfort in our fear and loss. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We hold up our fears and uncertainty about the pandemic. We surely did, did hope to be coming back together in safety, without masks and distancing, singing our hearts out in praise that it was over, saved by the science and learned industry of the creation of a vaccine. But it is not over. A new variant, resistance to vaccination, wars waged on social media about who is right and who is wrong, and the result is we have to wait longer. Be patient, be careful, wear masks, and keep our distance for longer. We do not know how long this will last or how many more people will die. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We see the whole world reeling from storms and fires and wars and man's inhumanity to man. We pray for families caught in the crossfires between warring factions. We pray for human beings caught in the aftermath of floods and hurricanes and national, natural disasters related to climate change those who have lost everything they have and are without shelter and food and even basic protection. The uncertainty over what will happen nest, next must be terrible. Will they be able to meet their basic needs? It's so hard for us to imagine. We can pray, we can give our money, we can get involved with organizations who provide help, it doesn't seem like enough. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, all of this is also very personal. We carry the dread of sickness that could mean vastly change life, even the end of life. So many carry the weariness of chronic pain that demands daily endurance. For others, the sadness and loss is the result of an end of a relationship, of losing a job, the struggle to find another job. We all carry the burden of mistakes we have made, big ones and small ones, that we pay a price for even now, still. We ask for your strength as we try to forgive ourselves. In the phrase, the hell of the parade of things going wrong and the heaven of none, Brian Doyle adds after that, the heaven of none. Such delicious absence. The absence of things going wrong is indeed delicious. We are grateful for all that is good. Our lives are full of wonderful moments and opportunities with our families, our friends, doing meaningful work, having fun, time away from home to relax, life-sustaining ways to spend our time and use our talents that make life worth living. We are grateful for the absence. Things going wrong, things not going wrong, you, divine creator, are with us through it all. For all the very personal and profound things we are aware of at this moment, may we graciously receive your spirit of truth, your comfort, your advocate, advocate sent to stand with us. 
as Jesus spoke to his followers long ago, he still speaks to you and me right now, saying, But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And all God's people say, Amen. On Friday evening, some of you perhaps were here for a movie outside. As I came into the office this morning, I noticed all sorts of boxes on top of Diane's desk, godly play boxes that are going to be distributed since the pandemic has kept us from doing those godly play lessons in person this fall. A little while after this service, there will be a blessing of the backpacks and briefcases and all for the school year over in Frady Park. All of these things, all of this ministry, all of this work to be community in a time when we are separated happens because of staff and equipment and resources that your generosity allows us to have. Thank you for keeping the church going in a time when the building is mostly still closed. And now in this time when we would typically pass the offering plates, I invite you to think about how God is calling you to give of yourself to continue the ministry of Christ in the world. We will not pass the offering plates, but there is an offering plate that will be on the, the stand as you go out following the service, if you would wish to give. Now, let us reflect on how God is calling each of us. Let us pray. Thank you, God. Thank you for your love that brought forth creation, your love that seeks us out, your love that comes to us in Jesus and suffers with us and for us. In great gratitude for the love we have received from you, O oh God. We offer ourselves to you. And ask that by the power of your Spirit, we might indeed commit ourselves to the work of your coming new day. That day when your will is truly done in all the earth. That day Jesus called the kingdom and taught us to pray for, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So close, we thank you again for joining with us, both those of you who have joined us in person and those who are with us at home. Uh, as we prepare to go about our daily lives, I remind you of all of those things that are going on in the life of the church that continue to go on, even though, again, the building is mostly closed. Uh, I'll highlight a couple of the things that are in the list of announcements there's a welcome table this week, and we always are in need of volunteers, usually especially with set up and clean up. And even if you work, the clean up is usually after most of you get off work. Drop and Dash is next weekend, which includes a pop top collection. Um, so you can bring both your food items and your pop top. There's also a congregational uh, meeting scheduled for September the 26th or immediately after worship to elect a congregational nominating committee. That's in there, there's a, a one missing item in that announcement, and that is that uh, Bonnie Seklecki's name is left off of the list of congregational members on that committee. And finally, uh, just a quick note. You may have noticed that there's two sets of flowers today. Um, one is in honor of the Packers' 30th anniversary. Congratulations. <clears throat> The second is there because it is the, some of the flowers that were at Doris Webb's graveside uh, in Arlington Cemetery on Friday. Uh, and it was remarkable for me to do that service there in Arlington with the Pentagon in the distance on the day before the 20th anniversary. And it makes me continue to reflect on a God who comes to us in Jesus, who moves into the suffering of the world, who's not the conquering hero that perhaps we want or expect. And now as God's people, let us go into the world to be God's people, to share the way of Jesus with the world, to share the love of Jesus with the world. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor all the days of your life and grant you peace forevermore. Go in God's love 
and peace. I forgot one thing. There's lemonade on the lawn today. Uh, it will be around on the front side of the church, so hope that you will join us for refreshments following this service. Let us go into the world.